Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us for this, the second last session on the last day of CISO Forum Canada 2020. A little bit of a story before I introduce myself. I remember when we got together as a planning committee back in March 2019, seems like almost uh, in, in the times of BC, before Corona, a long time ago, and we were dreaming about a CISO Forum Canada we never quite knew how it was going to come together. Today we stand at a point where we're not just dreaming, we're making a lot of memories. And memories implant themselves deep within you and inspire you and aspire you to do much more than what you've already done. I want to thank the team at CyberX, and more importantly, I want to thank the advisory cohort of close to about 45 cybersecurity champions across Canada who have come together in these challenging times and not build barriers, have continued to build bridges. My name is Ali Hirji. I lead both the AI and cybersecurity practices at Durham College. And it's my pleasure to bring you this session where we're going to be discussing how women leaders are addressing the talent pipeline. The session is brought to you by our friends from Windsor Essex, and I want to thank them and give a shout out to their entire team for making this happen. Talent, as we're going to be discussing, kind of like electricity, right? We don't know how it works but we use it. A teacher of mine once said that, listen Ali, if I show you something, you're likely you're gonna forget it. If I teach you something, you'll probably remember. But if I involve you, you're definitely gonna take that with you a very long way. The panelists that I have today are individuals who have involved not just women, but other groups, other minority stakeholders in the conversation around cybersecurity. I've said this before, cybersecurity is not a science necessarily, it's an art as well. And there are different elements that speak to cybersecurity as an interdisciplinary practice. You have folks from psychology, you have folks from philosophy, sociology, from computer science, from economics, all speaking to bolstering and strengthening our cybersecurity ecosystem. And I'm humbled that my panelists today have all played their roles in making sure that we can communicate and bring together the right people to build our Canadian ecosystem. We're gonna take the first few minutes to allow them to introduce themselves, and I'll go to each one of them and ask them to say a little something. Let's begin with Sherry Rumbold. Sherry, please introduce yourself, the organization that you work with, the title that you hold, and tell us about what brought you to the world of cybersecurity. Sherry? Uh, thank you, Ali and CyberX, for having me. Uh, my name is Sherry Rumbold, and I am a National Information System Security Officer for the Department of National Defense in the Canadian Armed Forces. And I've actually been in uniform for 22 years in the Army before uh, becoming a public servant. And uh, I uh, got into the world of cybersecurity many years ago now. This is my 30th year in IMIT and cybersecurity. So I'm dating myself, but uh, been having a fun journey along the way and how time flies. It's just been amazing. So uh, I think that for me, it's just really the passion of, of looking at uh, operational environments and how to protect those networks and how to protect Canadian citizens that actually became my passion for wanting to do cybersecurity. And uh, it's been an amazing journey along the way. Fantastic. And that word journey always resonates very strongly with you. Um, you know, they say, right, success is, is not a destination, it's a journey. And I'm looking forward to unpacking that journey and some critical steps that you had taken in this path and continue to do. We're now going to go off uh, to Windsor, uh, our sponsors who have put this session together. Nicole, we have two Nicoles on the line. So Nicole from Windsor, uh, if you can introduce yourself, what is it that you do? And can you comment a little bit about the support that you're providing to businesses from a cybersecurity perspective? Nicole. Sure, thanks for having me. I'm Nicole Anderson. I'm from the Windsor Essex Economic Development Corporation, and I'm the Director of Women Entrepreneurship within the region. Um, we received a, a, some funding from the Federal Government of Canada, as well as the U.S. Consulate in Toronto to empower women um, entrepreneurs, but also women working in STEM. And women working in STEM, obviously, um, you know, works with women in cybersecurity as well. So working with those groups to help empower them, help bring resources to them, whether that's financial, mentorship, um, networking opportunities for them to, to feel empowered within their careers and to ascend to leadership positions. 
Fantastic. And this element of entrepreneurship and cybersecurity, we, we talk a lot about the made in Canada security solutions. And this is a topic that uh, it hasn't just stayed rooted to entrepreneurship. It's something that's come up even in my previous session on threat hunting, when we were talking about the tools that we use. Specifically, we were talking about how you use certain log stashing tools like Elkstack or Grey Logs or whatever else have you. And this element of how a Canadian spin is brought to these tools really allows the CISO to gain some confidence and some trust, especially when we talk about nation states and threat hunting. So thank you for bringing that up and emphasizing the importance of homegrown solutions. We'll go to Victoria and then we'll go to, to the other Nicole. Victoria, introduce yourself, the position that you hold, and tell us very briefly about your role at IC Square. Sure, thanks so much, Ali, and thanks everyone for having me on. I'm president of IAC Squared Toronto Chapter, IAC Squared being the US-based global organization that does cybersecurity certifications such as CISSP. But the chapter here in Toronto is focused on doing educational opportunities and networking for its information security professionals. But also, I'm also excited to, uh, to say that we've also expanded the kind of audiences that we talk to. We have done events for parents and children. We have done uh, small and medium business focused events uh, to spread cybersecurity knowledge. Um, in my day job, I work in cy major cybersecurity incident response at a large financial institution, and on a part-time basis, I hold uh, the position of instructor at York University uh, in cybersecurity as well. Thank you very much, Victoria. And again, to our audience, I want you to pay attention to the fact that we've brought in a really diverse cohort here. When we speak about diversity and the talent gap, we're not just talking about diversity from a social perspective. We're talking about diversity of skill, diversity of thought. And as you heard from Victoria, not just working in the field of incident response, but teaching about it academically, and then applying it and doing the, what we call knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization. I encourage you to look up that term because it's slowly but surely, it's creeped up a lot in the social sciences and the medical sciences, but it's starting to find a life of its own in the world of cybersecurity. How do you take technical concepts and explain it to our seniors, who, for example, are now rendering all of their medical records digitally? Very interesting conversation that we'll be talking about and relating that to the talent pipeline. And lastly, Nicole, introduce yourself. Let us know what your title is. And importantly, tell us what brought you to CISO Forum Canada. Nicole. Excellent. Hi, my name is Nicole Briard. I'm, I'm actually probably the least directly involved in this cyber world, but I have as a CIO, so I'm CIO for Aviva Insurance, which is a global company, and I'm a CIO for their Canadian operation. Um, my role, uh, what brought me to this forum, one, my role is to oversee, and, and throughout my career as a CIO, um, I have overseen or managed this the cyber world as well. So whether it sits beside me or within my organization, it has been a bit of my career. Um, what brought me to this forum, one, it is probably the most popular of my conversations with boards, within my colleagues from an awareness and education perspective, and certainly within the talent because it's the area of talent that we have that we really need to focus on and build and acquire, and it's probably the most challenging. So there's a lot of thoughts around that. Yep, and as you, you mentioned very eloquently, and the, the understanding the diversity of our talent, but more importantly, when you related the fact to the work that you do in insurance, cyber insurance in and off of itself, understanding the world of insurance, understanding how you can get institutions to protect themselves without necessarily trading in fear, that communication mm -hmm. element as well, speaks to the talent pipeline and some of the skills that we need to be addressing. So thank you to our, mod, uh, to our panelists for introducing themselves. And I'm gonna jump into a couple of questions as an FYI to all of our listeners. When you're watching, there's a live chat feature there. You can drop your questions there or send it directly through different social media means and then it comes to me in a central feed. Sherry, I'm gonna start off with you because my focus here is not just talking about the theoretical and philosophical elements of diversity, but I wanna look at some operational steps that we can take within your institution or within your network, how are you creating programs or opportunities for diverse groups to join or to at least experience what a SOC environment may look like or what a incident response scenario may look like? What kind of programs are you aware of, Sherry? 
Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to some of my uh, volunteer work with uh, institutions such as ISC Squared and ISACA and uh, other groups in which we're, we're trying to build that talent environment in which we're, we're providing with them programs and, and training so that they can actually sort of live a day in the life of some of the areas that we're all working in. So as a, as a community out here in the West, we have a, a big, big cybersecurity community that are very inter, interlaced and, and we can communicate all the time, even in this virtual kind of environment. And what we like to do is we like to spread that, uh, you know, our our background, our training experience expertise in in with folks that are looking at coming into different fields. And as we know, there's like so many different areas of profession within cybersecurity. I mean, 50 plus. Uh, so, so many different diverse areas. And uh, I know that Victoria can speak to incident response and all these other things. And it's like, how do we actually build those blocks so that we can get people involved? And uh, some of the key things is, is looking at each environment and saying, what's, what, what is it that I'm interested in? And then what kind of background do I have? So not necessarily going to take somebody that is more interested in education and awareness and have those softer skills and put them in a SOC environment right out of the get-go, yeah. unless we want to give them some stress. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's really important to, for, for, for institutions to give that that perspective of what each of these areas look like speak to the people that are actually doing some of that work and explain to them how that goes and and i've kind of done a little bit of you know in working in socks working in incident response forensics advanced analysis threat analysis whatnot and all of those environments are sort of intertwined but then there's a huge soft skill element that's also involved in that and then it's like looking at each of those personalities and building you know that individual those individuals based on what they're interested in doing and again i think that it's important to layer uh those skills so um one of the things that i always say is is reach out to your mentor and your knowledge base and and get that expertise and get that sort of what is it like to live a day or two in your shoes and then build your your perspectives on that i think the aspect of building perspectives and living the life in somebody else's shoes I've always said this to my students as well, is that you know, don't just necessarily go down the path which has a trail, or the trail which has a path, rather. In fact, go down those trails with no paths. Tread your own. And one of the things that we do often is that, especially at the college, is we present certain scenarios. I remember about two to three weeks ago, we were presenting a scenario around different nation states feuding with one another, and then bringing in an outsider perspective and asking that person to share what they thought about the data that we were seeing. It's interesting what happens when you bring diverse perspectives to the table, because when you're looking at a data set from a technical standpoint, and somebody comes in from a business standpoint, they can relate certain things and look at, hey, you might be seeing that spike because of what happened in the stock market in that particular country on that particular day. That diversity creates insights, which is important for all of us. We will work on that a little bit as we go through this panel. I want to go to Victoria and then to both the Nicoles. Victoria, present, you know this aspect of bringing people into somebody else's shoes. What have you been doing to sort of knock on the doors of people who haven't necessarily thought about being in cybersecurity? How have you tried to make it digestible for them? How have you tried to show them this is the role that you could play? Not necessarily presenting in front of them technical courses, but what kind of workshops have you been doing that sort of translate the information better? Victoria? Absolutely. Uh, there's so many wonderful initiatives that the chapter is is doing uh, from creating a, and launching a mentorship program a couple of weeks ago, uh, all the way up to uh, to having specific workshops dedicated to uh, to populations, like I mentioned, who that are not our usual audience, so non-information security professionals. Um, it's very important to be able to break down cybersecurity concepts down to the basics and be able to relate them back to the audience and to what their context may be. If they are running a small business, what would the like what would the implication of these cybersecurity principles and and different events and incidents that you're describing be to them? So um, so definitely uh, definitely important. The communication aspect is definitely important. Like Sherry mentioned, having those soft skills is extremely important. So. Um, even if you're coming in with a, the highest of technical skills, if you're unable to communicate whatever you're doing in an effective manner, it is very difficult to a, collaborate with others, but also a relationship build and build something bigger than what you're working on. Thank you so much. 
We'll go to Nicole from Aviva first and then go to Windsor because there are a couple of questions that I want to talk about when it comes to businesses and empowering women especially, but other diverse groups with their cybersecurity practice. Nicole, I want to uh, see from your perspective, are you finding that within your organization itself, there's more of a diverse thought process around who wants to get involved with certain aspects of cybersecurity, who want to get be at the table to talk about certain subjects around privacy. Are you doing anything within your teams now to at least orient them to this new realities of cybersecurity? What kind of workshops are you running? What kind of internal programs are you considering in order to sort of diversify how your firm is thinking about security? Nicole? Sure, and, and we don't have all the solutions in place, but it's actually an active conversation. But um, we do hold cyber forums. So a bit, um, as Victoria was saying, we, we have these forums which we open it up to all our um, population at Aviva and Aviva Canada. We are a global company, so sometimes we can steal from other markets that we're in. Um, but we hold those to not only raise awareness about cyber, but also raise awareness about the different roles yeah. that we have in our cyber teams because they are different, I think, um, as was mentioned. They're very different and they appeal to different people. So we do have those forums um, and, and use those two angles, awareness and attraction of talent at the same time. We also have, um, I've used different tools in the past to make sure that um, I can get some of those insights on those blockers because sometimes they're perceived blockers that women don't want to enter or diverse, like diverse candidates don't want to enter specific fields. So we have, whether it's called advisory committees where we bring in really grassroots talent to have those discussions um, and we call them listening sessions as well to really understand what what is development for people, what is diversity and inclusion and where are the barriers that you know, honestly, that we see from different places. So we're trying to do it from many different perspectives. One of the things we're considering highly, because we do um, see that we need to train our talent for the positions that are really hard to acquire. So we are looking at what is the rotation that we actually probably even expect for a leadership position that someone will have done a rotation in the cyber world, not only to educate them on what's really important in cyber, but also to, to just get them aware and, and build that diversity in. And then you get leaders that are very much better versed in cyber in you know, all of their careers. So it is something that we're starting to work on. Fantastic, and I think this aspect of, you know, we've just, we're starting to work on. I think it's very important for our audience. We, I know we have over about 150 people that are listening, a lot of C-suite executives, is that this is a constant work in progress and it's constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. You've heard me say this before, innovative thinking, innovative approaches are never set in stone. If anything, they're set in jello. And you have to be a little bit prepared for that uncertainty. That uncertainty is beautiful, provided mm -hmm. you're open to receiving it. I want to park that aside a little bit because we've got a good sense of some of the programs that, uh, that you have, have seen, some of the initiatives that you're taking, and some practical steps. But I do want to go to Nicole in Windsor. And this is from the aspect of the reality on the ground. When we, for example, in Windsor, Essex, if you look them up, uh, if you go onto cyberexchange.ca, uh, the banner ads are running, and you can look up the programs that they have. At the end of the day, especially for diverse groups, um, you know, underrepresented groups that are getting into the business community, starting off their business, it is Nicole Steam's responsibility to remind them about their digital footprint, to remind them to be safe, secure, and private online. But that comes at a cost as well. And groups that are marginalized, groups that may not have access to capital, often just want to get their business running and then think about security later. Nicole, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the funding programs that you have and how that can tie into empowering these groups with some tools and the lessons that they learn they need to be secure online. Nicole. Absolutely. So we've got uh, different funding opportunities down here to help you help, help students, help graduates and help those um, who already have careers start businesses in cybersecurity. So we've got organizations such as um, the Epicenter at the University of Windsor who offers funding to help you kind of ideate around what you're working on connect you with a mentor, um, and then also you receive funding to, to really help you develop your minimum viable product. And in this case, we do have some cybersecurity groups um, in place, which is great. And the mentors that we introduce them to are, are experts within the cybersecurity world. But what we do like to do is to ensure that they're, they're 
set up with mentors that help to reflect not only what they're trying to work on, but them themselves. So we do have a lot of female um, cybersecurity mentors, which is great to help amplify the voices of the underrepresented sector in terms of um, you know, females entering cybersecurity. Um, we have a lot of diverse mentors as well. We're, we're very cognizant about um, those opportunities and, and being really inclusive in terms of you know, who we accept into the programs in terms of the, 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 um, the applicant as well as the mentor in the mentoring program. So we've got that type of funding opportunity. Um, we've got an organization down here called Win, uh, WeTech Alliance, which is a regional innovation center. And they, they work with a lot of cybersecurity companies in terms of um, business consulting services. They help through your entire business planning process. But one thing that is coming through um, is, is helping to protect intellectual property. And that is, you know, that largely affects cybersecurity companies. So how do you protect what you're working on? And we are working with um, IP experts to help these, these new businesses who are working within cybersecurity to help them uh, protect their businesses. I think one of the most important aspects that come out of this is the KPIs and KRIs that need to be associated with such kind of programs. And like I said, you know, to our audience uh, in the advisory group when we were thinking about this session, you know, this isn't about just talking about at a high level, although that is important to open the conversation. On Cyber Exchange and with CyberX, we've been talking about women in cyber uh, you know, for a couple of sessions now, and now we really want to get to a, a playbook that we can follow. I do want to get to this, the KRI and KPI metrics, and that's actually a question that's come in. How do you measure success of some of your diversity-driven uh, pipeline initiatives? We'll come to that a little bit later on, but I do want to come back to Victoria now, and this is on this aspect of training. What's your perspective on, if you're developing a pipeline, how important is it to have certifications versus experience? I know the ideal situation is to have both go hand in hand, but are you feeling that some folks are not willing to enter into the space, maybe because the certifications are, and I don't target this at any particular group, but the certifications can come at an extremely high price tag, leaving low income folks out of it. How do you balance that equation between certification and just lived experience? Victoria. For sure. Um Personally, I, you know, I'm a big fan of certifications. I have quite a few of them myself. I think they're a great thing to have, but absolutely not a necessity to have to enter the field. Um, more and more, I see organizations who are willing to uh, to interview candidates who don't have the traditional background, so they're not coming from computer sciences or they don't have training in cybersecurity specifically, which is a wonderful thing to see because, as we mentioned before, we need professionals that come from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, because the cybersecurity problems we're still solving or trying to solve are really complex. We we need those different backgrounds. So one, um, I think that there is there is definitely um, certifications aren't a necessity necessarily. I, I do believe that having a passion and a drive that you're able to demonstrate in other ways is definitely a way, um, a good way to get yourself noticed in the industry. Participating in these kind of events, yep. networking, um, you know, training in other ways. There's so many amazing resources out there. And uh, getting in yourself involved in projects. There's lots of great projects going on um, in the community, um, like OWASP and, and others. There's, there's other ways to get yourself noticed as a candidate. Um, yeah, this is not the only traditional, I shouldn't even say traditional, I should say, uh, certification or cybersecurity or computer science education is not the end all be all for candidates. And I think people who are passionate about cybersecurity um, should have courage and apply to those job descriptions, even those that, that seem uh, that they don't, uh, that, that require so many years of experience or so many certifications. So go for it. Go for it. and. And, uh, and and make those connections and networking. Absolutely, and there's another element that I will make uh, obvious here, and, and Victoria has very eloquently put that forward, is that even the way in which we're doing training now has, has reshaped significantly thanks to uh, the realities of COVID-19. Yesterday, uh, the closing session was on the virtualization element of training, and we had an individual from Starship Dreams by the name of Tussar Singh, and he brought up these interesting realities about just the experience of training itself will tell you now the importance of diversity. And what he meant by that was how we now look for plagiarism, how we now look for people who are trying to cheat the system has shifted dramatically. 
and the standard process of proctoring exams has shifted. That's another example of why diversity in our talent pipeline, invigilators for cybersecurity exams, that in and of, of itself is becoming a skill set. So I really hope that everyone's taking some notes as to how diversity of skill and thought is now factoring into how we deliver cybersecurity experiences. I'm gonna go back to Sherry and then we'll go to both the Nicoles. Sherry, you know, from what Victoria said, you know, I, I always say this to my students as well, don't show me what you know. Sorry, don't tell me what you know, show me what you know. Ex you know, sh give me a lived reality. You know, run a module for me and show me what you can do in terms of finding a vulnerability and in, in terms of patching it immediately. Show it to me, demonstrate it to me. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on hackathons and events like just last week, Cyber, CyberX alongside IBM, RIT, the town of Ajax, put together the Cyber uh, Collegiate Penetration Testing Competition. What's the importance of these hackathons and what can we do to make them even more effective than they already are? Sherry. Uh, well, I think it's really important because, you know, I'm, I'm like a, a different type of learner. I think we all are different learners. I mean, if I look at my own perspective, I am not somebody that I, I, I cannot just sit down and read a, a thousand page book on cybersecurity and decide that, okay, I know everything. I, I'm very much more of a visual hands-on kind of person. And I came up through the, the world of IMIT. And I mean, you know, at one point I used to pull fiber optic cable and terminate and build uh, main termination rooms with routers and switches and the whole nine yards. So, I mean, I've done a lot of that stuff. I have been in the trenches, if you will, with, with, the, uh, with the gang. And uh, that's how I learned my craft and my skill. So I'm always a big proponent of taking not only the, the academia side of things, but then also applying it with uh, good hard work and, uh, and and putting your perspectives, you know, there. So, I mean, again, too, I mean, we have to learn through um, different means. Everybody learns a little bit differently. So it's like understanding what each individual needs. But at the same time, too, you know, we always need that practical knowledge. We always need a hands-on knowledge. And hackathons, uh, hackathons and all these other types of, of experiences where we're actually getting into uh, the down into the weeds of learning on how, you know, exploit activity is working, how we can, we, we find these exploits, how we, you know, mitigate against them, patch, whatnot, is fantastic because it takes you through the entire life cycle of an exploit or how something's actually got into your environment to the point where you actually do the remediation. And, and it, it teaches you everything along the way, not only through communication, soft skills and things like that. And, you know, we all got to write the non-sexy reports and things, but we also have an opportunity to do all of the great sort of getting into and looking at what's actually ha happening as far as the activity goes. And again, too, like I think that a lot of people realize, and I, I'm sure everybody here does, is, is that we have to take the good with the bad. And, and there's things that we do every day. Like I love being a part of hands-on activity, but I also have to write policy. You know, and sometimes that's not as much fun. Uh, but again, too, we've got to do this because as we learn, we have to solidify that learning and we need to put those those areas into place and make sure that we've got a history of, of things. And we do a lot of lessons learned and things from our, our different activity that we do in an operational environment. So really important to, to sort of go full circle and, and everything has its life cycle. So we think of incident response, it has a full life cycle from the discovery to remediation, same thing with vulnerability management, patch management, same thing with education and, and awareness to any type of area that we're working on, even as far as pen testing and, and, and looking at exploit activity, how we actually discover until we remediate. It's all very important. So I always say to you know people that I'm mentoring, look at the full life cycle of everything that you're doing, because there's aspects of not only writing, learning through, you know, reading and whatnot, but then there's also the hands-on piece of that. So it's, it's kind of an exciting field and it, it's nice to sort of always think about the end game. So not just that one little piece that you're working on. So exploit, hackathons and everything, all fun stuff, but we've also got to do a whole bunch of other things outside of that as well. 
I want to work with that just a little bit because, uh, you know, and if I can present my, my two rupees of thought, if you will, because there are two distinct conversations that we can draw from it. Often when people think about hackathons, you sort of think of it as that door that you can knock on and hopefully if it opens, get noticed by, by different sponsors and different vendors and, and get, get your next job. But there are two other things that emerge from this. Firstly, what you get from these hackathons is the element of recognition. And number two is also on the makeup of teams and you begin to realize how certain teams work and the biases that they're not opening their eyes to. So I wanna start with Nicole in Windsor and then we'll go to Nicole from Aviva. Nicole, can you talk to us a little bit about the kind of recognition programs that you have in place, celebrating women, celebrating diverse groups that have taken a leap into cybersecurity? Can you open that up for us just a little bit, Nicole? Absolutely. Well, through the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy, we we make an extra effort to celebrate women wherever we can. So we've got um, a few women in in STEM groups um, at the university and at the college, run by students, and we often highlight them. Whether it's um, you know on formal panels, whether it, 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 at actual events, or even just through you know uh, general marketing. But I know that recently we've had two very successful women in cybersecurity out of the University of Windsor, two professors, um, Dr. Ikja Saini and Dr. Mitra Amir Hassani have been recognized um, not only within our community, but on a, on a global scale. Um, so, you know, we, we, we take the importance of, of recognizing women in cybersecurity, especially in our region. Um, so we've got the groups, we, you know, we put them on panels and in February we've got a summit really amalgamating all of, all of uh, the activities that women are, are, be, are doing successfully in our region. And, and one, of the, one of the important pieces is cybersecurity because we do see a, a large underrepresentation of women in, it, in, in that sector. So Windsor's really trying to you know, change the face of different industries um, and cybersecurity is being one of them. Absolutely, and, and you know what? I've always looked at this, uh, these kind of uh, initiatives as you know, the door that opens uh, the opportunity to more doors, and you just need to have that strength to know how to knock on that uh, for that opportunity and ask for it. I do want to come back to the diversity of industry and experience that you brought up because there's some very interesting work happening in Windsor from an automobile sector and cybersecurity, and we'll come to that as we sort of come to a conclusion. We've got about 22 to 23 more minutes, and a couple of questions have started coming in, so I do wanna make sure that our audience is, is also brought in as they are an important element of the success of these kind of panels. Nicole from Aviva, I wanna talk to you a little bit about you know, the KRIs and the KPIs. And you know, when I mentioned the two rupees of thought, you know, one element was awards and recognition, but the other element is opening our eyes up to the unknown unknowns, our biases. You know, they often say that uh, the best way to sort of blind someone is to open their eyes because when we're seeing practices and we're seeing our teams in operation, you know, with very limited diversity, we, we think it all looks good. Everybody's happy, a couple of fist bumps, you know, everybody, well, uh, in BC before Corona, but you get the <laughs> drill. Uh, we sort of, we don't recognize certain things. But at the last Cyber Exchange 2.0, I forget, I think it was Karen Namani or uh, one of the panelists formerly from ICTC and had a extensive career at open text as well. I, I forget her name, but I'll make sure I give her credit uh, on cyberexchange.ca. She said, you know what, when we started to go in through these diversity kind of uh, initiatives, very, very methodologically with KPIs and KRIs, she said, we started hearing things that we wouldn't hear before. We were reading for what wasn't written. So what do you mean? She said, Ali, look at the way we refer to practices in cyber, like pen testing. We call it penetration testing. The reality is, is that these, these terms are loaded with different jargons and different stereotypes within them. Nicole, can you talk to us a little bit about how these diversity initiatives have allowed you to make some changes even around the way we talk about technology, the way we bring our teams together? What impact has it had on your team and the culture there? Nicole? Perfect, and, and I'll stick, you know, I'll talk about um, gender overall and, and what we do in, in broader than just cyber, but in technology. But you're right, words actually really matter. We've just realized that how we write our job posting or how we want to attract talent, we use words in there that actually are biased to certain genders. So we, we do, we actually have a tool and we, we have a service that we review everything when we want to attract talent that is actually gender neutral and doesn't, to your point, um, 
doesn't really affect a gender over the other. So it's really important from all aspects how we how we look at how we attract and what we ask for competencies for people when we put them in a role where before it was like, oh, you have to have three years in here, two years in here to do this job, where that could be very gender uh, biased because in the past only certain genders had those roles. So we look much more at competencies that we need because to back to the conversation about, you know, do you need a certificate? Do you need something? But if that certification is very gender biased, like what, what help is it to build? You know, it's really hard to then build gender diverse teams or diverse teams overall. So we look at competencies and, and then we really invest in building up talent versus sometimes buying that experience, because what you know today is probably not that useful in a year from now. So if you don't have the mechanism to really invest in building that talent, not just buying the talent, you're probably not going to get to your diverse uh, teams because you're going to be very way towards one, you know, one diverse profile. Absolutely, and and I've said this, uh, you know, time and time over again. Teach me today what I need to know for tomorrow. Uh, and that's right, you know, when we write curriculum, for example, you know, we know that, you know, when the students graduate, unless we give them applied experiential re learning experiences, really we're going to have to unlearn a lot of what they've learned because that's the speed and pace mm -hmm. at which that industry is moving. You know, an interesting comment has come in, and uh, I, I usually just uh, look at the audience for, for questions, but this comment is one that I definitely want to bring up, and that is on the side of, you know, we're constantly thinking about cybersecurity practices in terms of how we protect our applications. Even the folks that attack our applications have started realizing the importance of diversity. And this was brought up by Mark Dillon in the morning session on threat hunting, new and emerging threats, where he said, look at the makeup of the different hacker groups that are out there. You'll have certain geographies where the groups are smaller, but more controlled, more autocratic. You have certain groups where the groups are larger, more democratic, uh, and spread across different countries, masking and spoofing themselves in different ways. The reality is, is that the beauty of involving or bringing in diverse practices as we build our talent pipeline is that you can spread the nature of even in which you do threat hunting, the nature in which you protect your institutions. It gives you different lenses to look at the same problem and come up with different solutions. And that, for any CISO, having different solutions, different lenses on how you could be attacked and how you could be protected actually translates into an ROI. So I really hope to those who are listening, this isn't just a matter of an HR issue. This is a matter of getting a return on investment through a bit of a return on imagination. We've got another 15 or 18 minutes left, and Sherry, I wanna come back to you. And this is on the aspect of, uh, and, and, and I apologize if I'm getting too direct here, please feel free to, uh, to provide a high level response. But we have a lot of engagement from the federal government, and I know you're not a spokesperson for them, but you've been in that space. We have a lot of engagement from government in different areas of cybersecurity. But is it just enough to say, here's a little bit of funding, and here, get something done? How do we make sure that the funding is used in a way where it can be tr not necessarily tracked, but it can translate into valuable experiences? Sherry, your perspective. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that it, it depends on, you know, where the funding is coming from, too. So, I mean, we have to look at it from different as aspects. I mean, I know that from for me in the public sector, we're very, very huge advocates for co-op students and and for mentorship programs and all of these other things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's different for us because we're federal. So, I mean, we're not necessarily being, you know, I, I don't know about the funding programs that the federal government provides to other private and or, you know, um, pro provincial sectors. But I mean, for us personally, I mean, we're huge advocates of, of bringing in talent and, and going through that mentorship thing. I mean, for us, it's a little bit different, too, because there's a few more checks and balances to bring in that talent. And um, what we always say to folks, and I mean, CSE, uh, one of our partner organizations is always looking for, for students as well. And they've got some really fabulous programs on how to educate and how to, how to um, build that talent within. And I mean, I always urge people to go to some of these high performing organizations because, you know, as a co-op student, if you have that on your resume, you're golden. I mean, essentially, I mean, you're gonna get a job just about anywhere. Um, so, you know, again, to you know as co-ops i can speak to that go and and go to 
a diverse group of different organizations, private and public, and and select mentors, either formal or informal, to start building your repertoire. Um, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, like, I mean, you know, we, I've always been volunteers and working for nonprofits such as ISC Squared and ISACA and things like that. And we do a lot of things there as well to help build that talent and everything. So I can't speak to the actual funding programs that are out there because I'm not as, as averse in that, but I always say to uh, anybody that's, that's willing to, uh, that's willing to be a co-op for the federal government to try it because it's, it's really quite different than being in the private sector, but having different co-op experiences as you're in, in university and you're trying to decide what you want to do, it's a great opportunity because many people come and they might try federal and they'll say, yeah, you know what, it's good, or this is something that I want to circle back and maybe I want to do this 10 years into my career instead. But for now, <clears throat> sorry, I just want to be on the leading edge. Absolutely. And I think I'm being on that leading edge always reminds you, it keeps you, I think that the word edge is very, very powerful, right? You are on edge. You constantly know that in this journey of cybersecurity and improving yourself, so on and so forth. As I've said before throughout this conference, there are no finish lines. It's constant markers about what's next and what's next, and you continue learning. Cybersecurity is one of those spaces that here in the town of Ajax, for example, we have programs for seniors, right? ICVR, when it was open, we had a specific scenario for seniors. We had specific workshops for seniors as well. The journey simply continues. There is no destination. Thank you, Sherry, for, for really cleverly putting together how we need to be thinking about funding, but importantly, making that point clear about public-private partnerships. That, in and of, of itself, could be the subject of a separate uh, session altogether. So thank you, Sherry. We have another 12-odd minutes left, and I want to go to Nicole. Nicole, and this is another question that's come, I believe, from an entrepreneur. And this is on the element of funding and how it can be used for professional development. Often, funding programs that may come, and I'm not saying that this is specific to, uh, to Windsor Essex, but most of the funding programs that I'm familiar with, you can use it for capital purchases, you can use it for, for salaries, um, you know, to cover offset certain amounts of the salaries, but conference participation and training and education either gets a very small budget or simply is not eligible whatsoever. How are you addressing some of that, Nicole? Well, some of the it depends on where you live and and where you're um, you know where you are uh, applying to. But there you know there's there are always grants available. So the government website right now is uh, is inundated with with grants, especially you know to help combat with uh, through COVID nineteen. So really structuring why and how we are using the funding um, would make a tremendous difference. So for instance, you know say you're going to go to a conference it might not be saying that you're going to a conference to go to a conference it might be you know you're making connections you're you're meeting mentors really explain the end goal of why you're going to that conference um by looking at what that that fund might might want to what the goal of that specific fund might be so if there is a you know a fund to help um, start your business so for instance uh, at the university of windsor we have epicenter and the epicenter offers $6,000 grants through the summer to help students um, from any post-secondary institution and graduates start businesses. So this $6,000 grant really should be going towards their minimum viable product. But if you can explain through your application process that the funding might go to, let's say a trade show or a conference where you're going to make meaningful connections, whether they're with suppliers, mentors, uh, potential customers, that would be an eligible expense. So really crafting the message around why the, why it's important to attend these types of conferences will be beneficial um, in, in, in attaining a successful grant. Absolutely, and I think you know, we all know this about the, the science and art of grant writing as well, but one thing that I will say, and maybe because I'm coming on the backs of writing two grant applications, is make sure that, as Victoria brought up, on the element of networks and having diverse individuals who can write you that letter of support, who can write you that letter of recommendation. And again, this element of being at different conferences. You know, one element, sometimes we get asked, you know, why, why would uh, an organization necessarily sponsor a conference per se? Not necessarily always because of the sales element. Sometimes it's about those opportunities for networking, those relationships that you can build. I've always said this, don't make a sale, make a customer, make a relationship, make a friend through that process. So thank you, Nicole, for, for emphasizing the importance of 
parlaying your interests and making it clear why that's valuable to your business and those letters of support. The, um, Victoria, I want to come to you because we are getting this question. It's come up twice actually about are there any mechanisms or any innovative ways in which I can fund the way in which I take certifications? Not specific to IC squared, but are there any granting programs out there? Are there any microfinance or blockchain-based funding programs that I can tap into that you are aware of, Victoria? The ones, uh, a lot of there's a lot of scholarships available, that, but that they're based through IC squared based in the US. I'm not too familiar about Canada. Maybe um, there are other individuals on this on the, uh, on this panel who could speak to them more. Um, but the one of the things that uh, I have seen individuals do is they would um, uh, they would go through learning for, uh, learning the material for the uh, for the certifications they want to take, and then once they're able to secure um, a position, their their job is usually willing and and able to help them fund that certification as well. Uh, as you mentioned, they're, they can be, get quite expensive. So, but if the the role that you're in, uh, if they truly value the skills that you bring and the and the things that you're learning, they're willing to make that investment for sure. Fantastic, and thank you for that. And what I will also say to uh, to our listeners uh, and to those who are looking at you know for the programs to develop talent pipelines, so on and so forth, is reach out. Go on cyberexchange.ca. We've got representation from IC Squared, from EC Council, from SANS, uh, from ISACA, and other certification bodies, and talk to them. If you're an organization that's looking at mechanisms to maybe look at running a bulk course or maybe having a asynchronous model, there are a lot of different models that have now been realized. I think CyberX themselves also runs different models where they, they throw in board games. They throw in a whole different way in which you can get some of these certifications and those CPE credits that you need to retain that as well. So when we are talking about the talent pipeline, diversity and how we provide access to this, which takes us to another point around access and accessibility of training for our talent that's out there. Nicole, I have a question for you. And this you know, this statement uh, is not my own. There's a good friend of mine here in the Durham region, Dustin Kello, leads one of the most successful recruiting firms here, where he says, you know, often we hire for skill and then we fire for fit. And we realize fit because of various things, but we also realize it because folks don't adapt to new technologies or take on new technologies that readily. From a professional development perspective, what's been your optic and how is it just about here's the fund that I have and whoever claims it claims it? Or do you have a particular program in place for your talent to uh, to come to you and say, I want to take so-and-so training. What's your perspective on professional development? Um, it's something that's really key, like I said, especially in these strategic areas. So we always look at, we, we do, like a large organization, have training budgets and development budgets, because it's not just about training, it's about what we talked about, rotation experiences. And But we do, we, we qualify that, but what are the strategic skill sets that we need to invest in? Yep. And then like, how, what are the mechanisms that we could invest in those? So whether it's internal, whether it's external, or whether it, it is like formal certification or education, and we have all those mechanisms in place. But I think it's important to always revisit those and, and knowing where you need to invest Either it's harder to to retain or attract talent in those areas, or it is just a moving science that's really quickly. Um, and you talk about fit. I think the fit in those areas that are really hard to attract talent and retain talent is almost around that learning capability, knowing that you'll have to constantly reskill, retool whether it's technically or even on the business side, because cyber in, in a large organization is around understanding the business and how to protect it. What are the, the, air, the business processes that you need to look at? It's not just about the, the technology around it. It's really around the practices. So, so you know, training and upskilling is critical in those areas that are, are so dynamic. Um, and, and it's where we focus. We focus in those areas that are strategic and hard to acquire and hard to retain. Fantastic. We've got about seven more minutes and I have one pressing question uh, that I'll bring up to all of you and then we'll have some closing remarks. And Sherry, we'll start off with you with a little bit of background here. You know, you've, you've heard about this example where they talk about if you, have, if you see a hungry person and, and you give him uh, or her or that individual uh, a fish, they'll eat for the day. But if you teach them how to fish, they'll eat for a lifetime. I just ask you to take a bit of a back step and question why is that person in that situation 
to begin with where we have to make that choice. What led them to be in that situation? Sherry, let's start off with you. In terms of cybersecurity education, we're still not necessarily seeing it happening at, at an early stage. It, it may kick in you know, the grade 10s onwards, but we don't really talk a lot about it, although we're starting to, we don't really talk a lot about it in the early stages. How important is it to you from a national perspective that we now include our young ones in the development of our cyber skill sets? Sherry? Oh, I think it's essential. And, um, you know, some of the things that we've been doing is is uh, starting to, we, we, we had this focus group a couple of years ago uh, in, in my community for, for cybersecurity educators and whatnot. And we're like, okay, so what's our target audience, really? I mean, it's not university and college students anymore. It's, it's like, really, we have to start looking at grade eight. Uh, you know, we're thinking grade seven, probably a little bit too, you know, like, I mean, they, even though they're still very, very cognizant, but then grade eight is like when, I think that's when we start to really sort of think about what do we want to be when we grow up kind of thing. Uh, but then also building that skills in and making sure that everybody is, is, is becoming more and more aware of what's there. I mean, cybersecurity is embedded in every single thing that we do now everything it's like you know it's helping us with what we're deciding to 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 put in our refrigerator to to our alarm systems for our houses uh for all of our, our uh you know fancy gadgets that we use every single day kids are gaming more because they're at home and they're they're uh, you know uh, kind of not going out as much so there's a lot more of an online presence it's so important to to try to get these educated as you know grade eighters and so uh right now at this very important stage in in their lives and and i mean we need to target them um and start to build their skill sets and say why is it important that we have a cybersecurity mindset why is it important that we need to educate on protecting ourselves online and and what 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 the importance of even you know we were having some discussions a few days ago about facial recognition and things and some of the apps that are out there and how mm -hmm. how those are sometimes often for good but they're also often for bad and 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 we have to you know educate kids on the importance of of you know every single thing that you put online there is a bit of a a reverse um scenario that might go along with that and then having that education at mindfulness there because it is going to be continuous to be every single thing it's it's in cyber and security is in everything that we do and and i think that we all realize that but the problem is is that we're not looking at it from that you know sometimes we got to take it from two to ten thousand foot level and then say you know what is that you know and how can we educate and how can we we sort of give the basics so that it's understandable without getting into crazy technical details about what cybersecurity means and and when we were still allowed to go into the schools we had a mentorship program here in which we would go in and we would sort of speak to the students so we would bring some of our folks from the police force we would bring uh some cybersecurity professionals we would bring some folks from privacy and we would like kind of go in and, and do these little tech talks um and i found that they were very beneficial so you know it's kind of a good idea if even CyberX or somebody, maybe we can do these kinds of things and, and bring these little tech talks to the students, to, to the community. Even more now than ever in BC days, as you say, uh, Ellie. <laughs> yeah, <after> corona. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would agree with you 100%. And, and again, I hope our audience has tuned into the fact that you know this when we talk about diversity, diversity is a very diverse concept and there are numerous elements to it. And you know, I don't want to, I know I'll leave it to the CyberX team, but as an advisory, we've been talking a lot about access and accessibility and equity. And we've got very few, uh, little time left, so I do want to breeze through this very quickly so we can conclude and then allow for the next session, which I am moderating, so I need to prep for that as well. Nicole Anderson, we'll go to you, we'll go to Victoria, and then leave closing comments with to Nicole Bruyard. Nicole, in terms of new immigrants, uh, in terms of, because again, with the cost of living, you know, going increasingly high in our urban cores. We have a lot of folks who are coming to the Windsor Essex area. You're doing some work in automobiles and cybersecurity to attract talent. How are you making sure that you can attract talent and give them a space, especially cybersecurity talent, and give them an opportunity to make Windsor home? Can you talk a little bit about that, Nicole? Sure, and I, and I think it goes back to what uh, the other Nicole had mentioned. It's, it's being inclusive in our language to begin with. Okay. Um, 
you know, even recently we started speaking with uh, the LGBTQ plus community and even using the term women, um, M-E-N at the end has now shifted to M-X-N and not being mindful of, you know, some of the terminology that might pose a bias or might be a little bit threatening to newcomers um, might might uh, eliminate them from from the the um, the pool of applicants into some of these automotive types of companies or cybersecurity types of companies. So really being inclusive in our language in order to attract them and then and then having the opportunity to to hire them would be very important as well. And Fantastic. And, and I do encourage all of you, you know, the, the CyberX team, again, shout out to you. There's these little notes that are flying through the production. Uh, we are running through a simple system, but panelists, just so you're aware, people who are watching on cyberexchange.c are getting um, a CNN grade style production where they're seeing little notes come down. Please take some time to visit these sites and the resources that are available to you. Victoria, very quickly, what are you doing to ensure that your chapters grow, not just in urban locales, but in other rural and remote communities as well. Any initiatives that you're engaging in, Victoria? Oh, for sure. So right now, um, in the COVID era, uh, it's quite easy to reach uh, audiences from all, the, all over the world. Absolutely. So what we do have, we do see more people tuning into our Toronto events from all, all over Canada and all over the world, which is amazing to see. And uh, and also our our members are using their networks across the world, the world to expose them to our events as well. So it's amazing. Um, there's one thing that I wanted to mention sure. before, uh, just as, as an aside, is uh, representation matters. So we try to make, uh, to put people on stage from all sorts of different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, uh, all genders, and all um, all kind of professional educational backgrounds as well. Um, because if you can see it, you can you can easily picture yourself being it. Absolutely. So we, we keep that in mind as well. Absolutely, and, and I think this element of, you know, I always tell my students, we're starting with tabula rasa, a blank state, uh, and a blank canvas to begin our work with, and how you represent yourself and who you bring to the room really says a lot about uh, your own thought process and expanding your network. I've said this repeatedly, get comfortable with being a little uncomfortable, and uh, these conversations are extremely important, especially when you think about it from a political standpoint. The previous session with Debbie Reynolds from the US, she kept, she said it not once, twice or thrice, uh, that uh, I'm very jealous of the ecosystem and the systems that we have in Canada. And one of it has to do with the fact that we are cognizant of this represent representational bias. And when we begin uh, the, uh, every cyber exchange session or a CISO Forum Canada with the national anthem, you know, we, we are aware of our commitment to our values. And I think that's extremely, extremely important, not just for citizens of Canada, but a lot of the immigrants who come here from other countries with skill sets that we utilize, that we're not just looking to drain them for their talent, but looking to make them a part of this fabric we call Canada. So thank you for bringing up that point. Nicole, we'll come to a landing and closing comment with you. Not only are you an extremely busy individual, all of you here are extremely effective. How do you make sure that your team, when they realize that you're going to these conferences, that they can see why you're doing it? What do you tell them when you tell them, I am speaking at this conference? Is it that, oh, I'm speaking at this conference, wow, I am so smart? Or is it, I'm speaking at this conference and I want you <laughs> to see why I'm doing it. How do you parlay the value of such exchanges to them? Um, well, first of all, usually when I speak at conference, it's not for Nicole. It is for, for you know, wh what, are we, what are we learning? What are we taking back in-house? But also, how do we expose what we do and potentially even attract talent who are attracted to our company come and, and work for us? So it's that exchange uh, versus like a one f for Nicole only, that would be not very useful for anyone. So hopefully that's that's not what's happening. I actually, one of the practice I always have when I go to the conference, I see it as a uh, learning moment for everyone, for me. So if there's a topic that I'm not, you know, it's not my day to day. Sometimes I'm, I'm a bit, uh, you know, sort of flying into and out of a, a topic. So I involve my team and they brief me and it's, it's great because I get to learn, but then I bring back what I've learned. I, and I've taken some notes, if, if anyone's seen me, I've taken some notes throughout because I have learned and that's my job, like out of this is really to go back to the team and, and have that dynamic exchange. So, so hopefully it's sort of that gift, gift that keeps on giving. But for me, it's both like one, we are one of the many companies, so it, it's one great way, but it's really a learning opportunity for the people with me on my team. Fantastic, and with that, I wanna give it a shout out to Maddie Raza, 
uh, who's, who's really built this platform very strongly. And I know he, he told me about how, I mean, I, I knew Victoria from before and he met Sherry through a network. I knew Nicole Anderson, but he told me he reached out to you. And that ability to reach out, he's one individual reaching out, trying to make these connections and then bringing value to the table. That goes a long way. Sometimes you have to have that shameless character to ask the question, to reach out. Wouldn't be the first time you either heard silence or the first time that you heard a no. So be, be powerful enough to ask. I wish we could go on. There's so many other more questions that have come up around financial elements of cybersecurity, pay equity, so on and so forth. So to my panelists, I ask that uh, you, you bear with me as I conclude this and stay on so we can have a 20 second debrief. But to our audience, what I will say is, uh, I hope A, that we were able to do justice to the practical and pragmatic steps that you can take when it comes to building diversity in your talent pipeline from an immigration perspective, from an ethics perspective, and more importantly, from other socioeconomic and political perspectives as well. Action items that you can take as leaders in your organizations and in your communities. If there's one thing that I took from this session is that, listen, when it comes to cybersecurity and education in cybersecurity, the mind is not a vessel that simply has to be filled. It's a, it's a candle that has to be lit, a spark that has to be set on fire, and I hope that your inspiration from this will set you on a path that will trailblaze you through the world of cybersecurity. And I hope to have another diverse representation on the next discussion that we have on this very topic, perhaps studying some of the lessons that we've learned and the achievements that we've made ever since. With that, I'm going to take your leave, and I will actually see you in another 20 minutes on a panel that's going to be talking about something that's very close to my heart, a dream that I once had about with other folks around a shared cybersecurity ecosystem that's now making memories across the province and across Canada. I'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of CISA Forum Canada. Take care, stay safe and stay healthy and have a good weekend.